Last week we uh, dealt with many of the aspects of the spring feasts and trying to keep them in balance, especially for Gentile believers. And you know, one of the, I, I think one of the things as we get back into our Hebraic heritage, and I, I found this same conundrum uh, with those just messing around in the New Testament. How many know there's a difference in spiritualizing something and finding spiritual application? Spiritualizing, it means that you just kind of dismiss it. It's no longer, you know, there, there's no power to it. There's nothing in it. Spiritual application is when you find the real body of what God was trying to, to do for us. You try to find the spirit of the law. And once you begin doing that, you find an application that releases its power. So it's the opposite of dismissing. It's really releasing the power that God wanted for the very thing he gave us a shadow of. And that's part of what we're trying to do with understanding the spring feast. It's not just going back and going through the rote of the shadow, but now that we have the body, mm -hmm. we right. want to release spiritual power. That's right. And so this week, I want to start from there, and I want to fold this back into uh, our teaching on the end of day spiritual warfare, because the, our understanding of unleavened bread, we need to take it to a new level so that we can have the proper spiritual application to release the power of what God wanted to do. And to do that, I want to go back and just touch on a couple of things uh, for us to have a foundational understanding. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 of Colossians chapter 2. Now, we dealt with last week, and I, I could actually expand. You know, one of the problems I had with last week, I took a six-week series and compressed it into an hour. And I was speaking so fast that I, when I went back and edit, trying to edit the video, I was stumbling over myself because how many know that uh, trying to do six weeks in, in one hour really doesn't work? And I, I could have took any one of the points that I had done last week and had at least done an hour to two hours on each one. There's so much there. Um, but we did deal with some of the things going on in Collage. It wasn't just Judaizers. It was paganizers. He had Judaizers on one side, paganizers on the other. In the middle was some amalgamation of the two with the, with the Gnostics. But let's look again at what the Apostle Paul said. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. But the body yeah. of Christ. Yeah. We need to understand that with the spring feast, we're not dealing with shadows anymore. How many know we've got the real deal? That's right. We've got the real deal. Yeah. Then I want to jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 because one of the things we need to understand is that the, the feasts were about remembering what God had done so that we're prepared for what God will do. They're a divine rehearsal. And there, there is power in the biblical concept of remembering. When man remembers his sin, he can repent. When man remembers what God has done for him, it does something on the inside of him. And we even see with God that there are times when God remembers his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or God will remember what he had done. All of a sudden, mercy begins to be extended toward God's people. There's power in remembering. And that remembering is directly connected to the feast. It is to cause us to remember, to prepare us for the end days. Makes sense, doesn't it? Right. Sure. Now, with that in mind, let, I want you to, this, this two things really jump out about when we take communion, because I believe Messiah interpreted the, the uh, Passover Seder, and I believe two things. Number one, if, if you have a Jewish background, you better end it with communion, you better preach the cross, because Messiah added to it. But for the Gentile believer, we can't look back to Egypt and being delivered. We look back to the cross. Yeah. And therefore, that Passover Seder by Messiah has been reduced to the bread and the wine, which is a new rehearsal for what's to come. Now, we may not anymore understand how that it's a, a, a rehearsal to prepare us for what is to come any more than the Jew did when they were going through and doing the spring feast. And all those years, all they saw was being delivered from, from Pharaoh. They did not see the coming of Messiah until he was there. 
And so we, we need to do the same thing. But I want you to look at what, what the Apostle Paul says. It said, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in what? Remembrance. He made, it, he made it a modim. He made it into a time of remembering. Remember what I did for you at the cross. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup of the New Testament in my blood, as often as ye drink of it in remembrance of me. With the old feasts, with the old way of doing it, God established it for the nation of Israel to remember what they had been delivered from and established too. See, here, here's the problem what I think we have in the body, and this this kind of a side note. We're constantly telling them that God delivered them to, from sin, but we've never defined for them what they were delivered to. And what we're trying to present them that we think they've delivered to, churchianity is not what you were delivered to. That, that, it, that is a cheap replacement for the real thing. Only when you realize, only when you remember what you've been delivered from and, rem and remembered, are reminded of what you have been delivered to, are you prepared to enter into what Messiah is going to do with that thing. Now we see Jesus becoming the body of the shadow represented in the spring feast. He also establishes a new rehearsal for the specific purpose of remembering that will prepare us for the days ahead. That there, there are secrets in communion that we don't even have a clue of yet. That God's going to teach us that as we see that day approaching, it's going to become more significant and more significant for us. Not less significant. I, don't know, I, that, I just like that. Now, I want you to think for a minute. Once Jesus became the body of the feasts, things begin to change. Number one, many Jews were being born again. That didn't happen under the Old Covenant. It was external always trying to get to the internal. Now all of a sudden because of the cross it's all eternal, internal trying to get to the external. Jews were being born again. They become spiritual alive and the Torah was written on their hearts. Later this new birth was expanded to the Gentiles. Something that God did not tack on. Something that God had in mind from the very beginning. He promised Abraham all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That's right. So it, it, it wasn't just, well, hey, I think I can add this to it. It was, it was always in the mind of God. Yeah. That new birth. But did you know that there was also a divine change in the Torah? Now, here, here's something for you. If it, was, if it was done away with, there wouldn't have been no need to change it. Just want to throw that out there, something to make you go, hmm. You don't have to go back and amend something if it's been done away with. But I want to go to Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. How many realize when you read the Torah that the Levitical priesthood was plan B? Have you caught on to that when you, when you read the stories? He said, I, he said when, they, when they all showed up to the mountain, he said, oh, I wish I could have made you a kingdom of priests, but because you have rejected my voice, I am selecting one tribe to be the Levitical priesthood. If therefore perfection, picking up with verse 11, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek? How many know that's Jesus? That's right. And not be called after the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity all, uh, a change also of the law. I want you to, oh, the law is eternal, but as it is fulfilled, God always tends to bring it back to his original intent. And so there was a change. We know, and, and does this mean that the Aaronic priesthood will not have a place in the millennial reign? No, the, the prophets very much speak of that. And Christians kind of wrestle with it, that if they're doing sacrifices, what does that have, you know, how, how will that affect the blood of Jesus? My thing is, number one, I don't have to worry about it because it's going to be during the millennial reign. 
Jesus is going to be the high priest that is the one telling them what they're going to do. I can speculate all I want, but let me tell you something. When Jesus shows up, whatever he says goes. Whether I understand it or not, I'm, I'm good with it. And so wrestle as you may, you can't wrestle with, with the air because it's, it's kind of like, how is it going to work? What's it going to work? How? We don't know. But all I do know is I have confidence in Jesus. But for right now, there, there has been a change, and even then I think there will be a change. We all are priests unto Almighty God, and there is a responsibility in that priesthood. And that's part of the spiritual application. Let me ask you something. How did you get saved? Did, uh, did you wait for, the, for Passover to come one year? And, and, and as you were taking Passover, you all of a sudden realized who Jesus was. And it was at that special time of the year that you got saved. Or was it because it is a fulfilled feast? It's available 24/7, 365, and all you have to do is all you have to do is embrace what Jesus did for you at the cross. In other words, it's a spiritual application that got you saved. Everybody, reach in your pocket, pull out your thinking caps, and put them on this morning. We're going to be using them. Because of what Jesus did with the spring feast, he became the body of that feast, that I don't have to wait around next year to Passover and give an altar call. I can, I can enter into that 24-7, 365. It is continuously available if I will behold the Lamb on the cross for me that unleavened bread that was the perfect life that became striped and pierced for me the moment that I repent and come under that I am born again because there's been a change in the law I like what Dr. Looper says. He says there's, there is the heavenly Torah and there's the earthly Torah, and God has constantly got to tweak and give us in revelation to get us up to that heavenly Torah. I like that. Now, the word change here in the Greek, metathesis, means a transfer from one place to another, a change of things is instituted or established. So it's talking about something that was instituted, that had to switch over back to plan A. And plan A was always about getting the whole world saved. Now, aren't you glad that God found a man named Abraham? That he could produce a people out of which Messiah could have been drawn from. And I mean, just that very fact should make us esteem and respect the Jewish people for all eternity. That they became a people that could produce... Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that produced David, that finally produced Jesus, who not only became the fulfillment of that which was promised, that seed was unto a seed as individual, not many. That promise that God gave to Abraham was to Jesus. And along the way in that line, God produced a David so that he could have a Davidic covenant to give a throne for Jesus to sit on. I mean, that's just good stuff. I mean, you get into this, you could just about have church any time that you want it. Now, and it's the same thing with the, we're, we're in the, con, the, the continual fulfillment of Shavuot. You know, just been meditating on, on a lot of these things, and Mary and I have always been, you know, expecting just all heaven to break loose every Shavuot, and the power to be here every, every Shavuot, and uh, we've been kind of disappointed. And so I went to the Lord and I said, you know, God, what am I doing wrong? You know, is this something that I've done that hells back to power? I know it's nothing that Mary's done, you know, because she presses in there ten times as hard as I do. And God says, no, you're missing the point. And I said, what? Just like salvation, the power of Shavuot is available 24-7, 365. The power is already here. All you've got to do is learn how to breathe it in, breathe in the Holy Ghost. 
You don't have to wait for Shavuot to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You just got to understand the cross, and you got to understand to become the unleavened bread. And I, one of the reasons I feel that many people have to tarry is because God has got to allow you to, to move through places that you become unleavened because unleavened bread can hold the fire. That's one of the reasons why in, in many, uh, even spirit-filled, they have something called tarrying. And during that tearing, it's not just sitting there begging for the Holy Ghost. What it is is them making sure that there's any, no leaven in their lives, and they get cleaner, and they get cleaner, and they get cleaner. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes in, and, and because they finally got, because there's, there was some piece of leaven the devil strategically put in their lives trying to hold back the baptism. And when they get to that piece of leaven and move it out, the baptism automatically comes. Yeah. And one of the things I have found, too, a lot of times when you're called to ministry, the devil makes sure that you're chock full of leaven to keep you from the power. Come on now. But it's the spiritual application. When we entered into this priesthood through spiritual application of what the body of Messiah was represented in the spring feast, and we are empowered in the priesthood through the spiritual application of the body of Messiah as, as represented in the summer feast, Pentecost. And guys, we are working toward seeing the full body of Messiah in the fall feast. And we're not going to see the full body of it till he comes back. So we have, we have, we're looking for, and we have a portion. And under this priesthood, spiritual application is paramount. Without spiritual application, you cannot function in the priesthood of Melchizedek. And you can miss the point altogether. And I know believers that they, they go through with some of the things we're going to find out about, about unleavened bread, and they, they follow the letter of the law, and they miss the spirit of the law. And the spirit of the law gives life. Why play with shadows when you can hold the real? That's right. Yes, that's right. And it's to our detriment under our priesthood if we do not look for spiritual application that we can, that we can implement to release the power in our lives. Let me tell you something, it's a whole lot different when you're shadow boxing than when you get in the ring. Not only for you, but how many know for the devil, as long as we're playing with shadows, he doesn't get hurt. It's when we get the application. The day that you made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life, the day that you bowed the knee at that old rugged cross and saw the Passover lamb, and the blood got put over your doorpost. Yeah. He got KO'd at that moment in your life. That's right. He invested from the time you were born. He invested all the, all the stupid things that happened to you, all the, the arrogance that came into your life and all the pride and everything else, all came in to keep you from that cross. And the moment you made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life, all those years the devil just lost. He couldn't stop it. And so I want to look for some spiritual applications of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I want to look at two places, Leviticus 23, verses 4 through 8. And then we're also going to be going to Exodus chapter 12, verse 15. If you find the function of the spiritual application the unction of that application begins to flow. Leviticus 23, 4 through 8. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. And the fourteenth day of the first, more, uh, first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. And the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servantile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. How many days? Seven, Seven days. And the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no servantile work. Now I want to go to Exodus chapter, tw uh, chapter 12, verse 15. I'm getting ready to tie this all together. Exodus 12, 15. 
Seven days ye shall eat unleavened bread, even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth unleavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Or uh, uh, leavened bread shall be cut off from Israel. Now, uh, as I get into this, I want to, I want to, something that I have dealt with in spiritual warfare and being in ministry. You know, there's, there's a reason I got gray in my beard. It's because I've been in ministry. Okay? And what I have found out, you have the shadow, and then the real comes. And if you're being affected by a religious spirit, it doesn't want you to get the real. It doesn't want you to get the body. Because if you get the body, it loses its hold. So it convinces you to play with the shadows. So that people get into all this religious activity... But if they're missing the body of it, and the religious spirit will always cause you to major on the minors and minor on the majors. And it doesn't just have to be about our Hebraic heritage. How many know the Baptist church is full of it, the charismatic church is full of it, that religious spirits will always major on minor things that you confuse religious activity with holiness, or religious activity with power, or religious activity with purpose. It's always the modus operandi of a religious spirit. But the moment that you begin dealing with spiritual application, religious spirits begin to scream and attack. I tell you what, I've, I've had religious spirits get mad at Mary and I for doing the word one minute and then get mad at the same minute that we quit eating pork because it was the other white meat, you know. <laughs> It's like, you're doing all these pagan things. What? You're not going to eat pork. It's, it's just because once you move and you understand, you know, the reason, you know, the, the, the number one reason I don't eat pork, number one, God said not to eat it. Number two, it's a conduit for demonic presence. And the last thing you want to do is to give the devil more places to plug in. You're supposed to reduce his outlets. <laughs> That's right. Get rid of them. But I want to look for spiritual application, not spiritualizing, which is to dismiss, but the spiritual application, especially since we have the body, okay? Seven is the number of God's salvation plan. That's one of the reasons why the menorah is so important, not a Hanukkah. I listened to one rabbi, and he said, he said I did a real honest search of the nine-branch you know, menorah that they have for Hanukkah. And he said, there's no precedent for the word. He says, somewhere along the Middle Ages or something, there was a constructive Jew that put that together as something to market for that feast. I mean, he was being honest. There's, there's no mandate. It's seven branches. The reason it's seven branches, there are seven feasts, and it's all about the salvation process. And God is saying during that, that salvation process of redemption, not only of you, but how many know that God has a redemption plan for the entire planet? There's going to be a restoration of Israel. There's going to be a restoration of truth. There's going to be a restoration for this planet under the millennial reign. That, that we, we do not see the fullness. We're still in process. How many know that the work of salvation is not completed? You, when you get saved, your spirit is born again. And then God says, okay, now that I've got your spirit in line, let's move on up to your head because your head's a mess. And you've got to receive, receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul, believer. And you've got to receive it with meekness. But how many know there's a day coming that I, my head can be right, my spirit can be right, but my body be falling apart. And God is saying, listen, there, there's coming a time for a resurrection that you're going to have a glorified body, that body is going to be redeemed, and sin and sickness and disease and pain will never touch it anymore. We're not there yet. We're looking toward the fall feast, understanding that it's coming. Yes. Okay. So that number seven is very significant. Seven days you're not supposed to eat leaven. Leaven is always a type and shadow of the world of Satan trying to enter, just like he entered into the garden when he stood, when he, when he was up in that tree, and he said, has God really said he introduced the leaven of his rebellion into the earth? And so, man, during this process 
of moving through to the completion of that new body, you better make sure you keep the leaven out. God does not care if during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you got a can of soup up in your cupboard that has some yeast in it. What God cares about is you have not gone through this feast and found out what leaven was in your heart, what leaven was in your life, what leaven you allowed in your house, what leaven you've allowed the enemy that you have hurt in your life that you've not allowed him to heal, that you have these attitudes in your life that you've not allowed him to heal, that there's leaven of the kingdom of darkness still abiding within your soul and you won't clean your house. Leaven speaks of the sin nature that permeates the world in this world system, and we are constantly getting exposed to it when we're exposed to the world. That's why the search is a continuous search during the seven-day process. It also says that we have to make offerings by fire for seven days. Offerings by fire. Priesthood, how do you do that? Every day you look for the leaven in your life. Resentment, pride, religious spirit, hurts, wounds, all these different things, and you bring them and you burn them up in repentance in the fire of the Holy Spirit, which is to purify. But, brother, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of afraid because it just said here that that if you eat a smidgen of leaven during these seven days, you're going to be cut off from Israel. I've after had that kind of spoke over me. You know what? The Bible says, he that holds out to the end shall be saved. That was, that was the conundrum for Calvin and Arminius. Calvin said, if you hold out to the end, it's a proof that you're the elect, that you're the redeemed. And Armenia says, no, if you hold out to the end, then you get to be the elect. <laughs> because there's an understanding during this process, we're actually going to go back and see in Revelation exactly what I believe we're talking about here. Because, guys, in, 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 in today's spiritual warfare, it will mean the difference between walking through the last days victoriously or giving in to the Antichrist. And the only difference is spiritual application. You can go through rote and go play with the devil because you'll, you'll end up in that river. Because that, that, that you can have no leaven in your house, but it's the leaven in your heart that will bring you in line with the Antichrist. The body of this feast is more for, more, far more than getting physical leaven out of your homes. It's getting it out of your heart. And God, guys, if we ignore these truths, we do so at our own peril. Things are different. I mean, when you approach the end of the end of the last days, how many know things are different? There, there's a, there's a, there is a transitioning. The saints are going to get holier and the world's going to get dirtier. And you can't play in the middle and be half clean, half dirty. It isn't going to work. It's going to be... One, one of the things, guys, that I saw when I was in the military is over there because you're... 2,000 miles away from anybody that would ever know you. I saw guys in our military, male and female, do some of the craziest things possible. Drink, parties, with everything going on that you can imagine. And one of the things I found out is there, there, there was no middle ground. That's one of the reasons I think God could just, was working such revival over in the military because there was one of two extremes. Either you're 100% for God or you're 100% for the devil. There was nobody playing with sin going to church, and there was nobody going to church that was playing with sin. And because of that, God could really move. I've seen things in people's homes of the power of God moving that I have yet to see in any charismatic movement in America in over 30 years. I've seen people kneel down to pray for someone getting saved because, you know, when you're, they have like stairwells where it's like apartment complexes, they can be three, four, five stories tall. And so you're sitting on the top story and there's this kid that you're seeing walking across the field that you've been asking God to save him. And I have seen believers fall on their knees and begin to cry and weep for that kid. That kid stop in the field, walk up the stairs knock on the door and accept Jesus. Now why is that? 
because there was no playing with the world while living in the kingdom. It was either one or the other. And as we approach the end of days, it's going to be one or the other. Now, in our priesthood, we have got to, we've got to maintain the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but because we have not understood the spiritual application, we have totally failed as a body. Turn to your neighbor and say, ouch. Okay, let me show you how. Jesus was the bread come down from heaven. He was striped and he was pierced for us. This is a perfect picture of Jesus on the cross. Unleavened, pierced, and striped, and he paid a price for us, yet the universal church or the church universal is presenting to the world every other Jesus except the unleavened bread imaginable. We have a powerless Jesus. We, we have a Jesus full of leaven. This bread can't abide no leaven. Just think about that for a moment. We, even, even when this bread took the stripes and the pears uh, that he, he pulled from when he was healing people was because he was able to draw from what he was going to do. He healed them and say, send no more lest something else comes upon you. Now, now when they're healed, we'll say, that's okay, go ahead and send because you're all under grace. Totally the opposite of what Jesus said. We have a wealth-centric Jesus. That's why, Brother Chuck, we can have prophets or prophetesses look at a demon-possessed man and say, God's going to make them rich instead of calling out the sin that's in their life because he's not unleavened anymore. We, we, we have a gay Jesus being preached. We, we have a Jesus that because of grace, he'll accept anything. So instead of having unleavened bread, we have sourdough bread, we have rye bread, we have pumpernickel bread, we have marbled bread, we got raisin nut bread. We, we have a mystical Jesus that's new agey. And it's really not about getting the sin out of your life. It's ascending to become a god. That's the Jesus that was trying to hang in the first tree, not the second tree. We have a Romanized Jesus. We have an Americanized Jesus. Just this week, Farrakhan preaching to the black Muslim nation said that Jesus was a black Muslim. So now we have a Muslim nation. And what's interesting is we had a Muslim before there was a Muhammad. There, there is every type, the Antichrist will add leaven back to the unleavened bread to take people from the reality of it. And it was our task as priests of the Most High God to ensure that the image of the unleavened bread that gave his life for us and died on the cross remained unleavened because only when he is presented as he really is does he draw all men to him and are they healed and saved and delivered. And he becomes the definition of what kadosh means, holiness means. And now we have so perverted who Jesus is that when people begin saying this is sin in the church they are branded as heretics uncompassionate yeah. unilluminated well how many know that if you're illuminated with black light doesn't mean you can necessarily walk in the light and most of the illuminated ones in the world today are being illuminated with black light, not the light of God, because sin will always be sin. It, it, it is amazing that as we are beginning to restore the unleavened bread to his place, which is part of our priesthood, people are finding out Jesus was Jewish. I, 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 that, that has been one of those bombs I've dropped in churches that end up having shock and awe. You know, they were shocked. They said, oh, that can't be right. 
I've actually said, he wasn't Jewish, he was Baptist. I got right here at the beginning of his ministry, he joined the Baptist church. That's actually a lot of Baptist doctrine, guys. I'm not being facetious about this. That they can trace the Baptist church all the way back to John the Baptist. So they say. How many know that's just stretching things just a little bit? Jesus wasn't Jewish. He was a good Baptist boy. No, he was a Jew that kept the feast, that kept the Torah, that became the embodiment of them. He is this. And until we start preaching the real Jesus to the world, they're accepting another Jesus, which is exactly what the Apostle Paul warned us about. Another gospel. It's not, if we're not preaching the gospel of the kingdom, we're preaching another gospel. If we're not preaching the Jesus who was pure and holy and that came to take sin away from man, we're preaching another Jesus. And let me tell you something, guys. Level one of keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread, our priesthood has utterly failed. Can you see that? Am I, am I being real clear this morning? Yeah. And God has got to point it out to us because when we start doing the spiritual application, I tell you what, sometimes when I go places, I'm not that popular because they start talking things about Jesus and they're bearing false witness and I just have to speak up. How many know that I have been the poo-poo in the potty several times? I, 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 I have been that guy, that preacher. There's some places I, I don't get invited back anymore because I'm that preacher because I got upset when they began putting leaven back in the unleavened bread. And I started giving testimony of who Jesus really is. And that mess that you're saying he's endorsing and he's funding, but yet you're struggling to get it done, I'm here to tell you the reason the kingdom of God isn't funding it is not the kingdom because it's all based upon another Jesus. That's part of our priesthood. We have, if he, if Jesus says, when I am high and lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And we're not lifting up the unleavened bread. And because of that, people can criticize and say, well, I see more of the world in Jesus than I do in, in the tavern down here. You know, the, the affluent of this world, the affluent, the ones that are really ruling have bought into the more, more Vigian heresy that believed that during Jesus' ministry, he was having a sexual affair with Mary Magdalene and that he faked his death and ran off and into France and had children by her and that all the ones right now that are ruling and reigning that are actually the ten kings that are going to bow down and give their power to the Antichrist, they believe they are physical descendants of Jesus. Let me tell you something. Your bread be puffy. It's full of leaven. Leaven of the lies of the enemy. And yet many of them sat on the throne of England, Spain, sat on financial empires. That's why in the seven churches in the book of Revelation, Jesus said there are those that call themselves Jews that are not but a synagogue of Satan. It's those that are attached to the Da Vinci Code to the more Vigian heresy that say that they have a right to rule and reign because it was given to them by Jesus and they're trying to reestablish the throne of David. They're trying to reestablish the throne of another David. And the church has tolerated it because we didn't understand the Feast of Unleavened Bread and what it represents as far as our duty in the kingdom that during this seven step process we had to keep the unleavened bread pure now let's deal with leaven in the assembly and I don't have time to do this this morning but if you really look at the seven churches in the book of Revelation God brought out some interesting things to me this morning or this week the first six churches all fought for the faith now, they had some problems. They did some stumbling. 
But Jesus said, I know your works, and I, I, I know the fight that you've been through. And, and the one he said, you know, you got to be careful because you, Je- you, you let Jezebel in there. You let some yeast into there, and it, you need to get it out. And to another said, listen, you've, you've been weakened by the, by the war that's going on, but go back and strengthen that which remains. And, and Sardis, and he, he had to encourage all of them that they were, they were fighting. When you get to the Laodicean church, Jesus didn't say, I know your works. He didn't say, I know the fight you've been fighting. The Laodicean church didn't fight at all. They let all the leaven come in, and they spiritualized it with their wealth. Wealth can mimic spirituality. It can mimic it. And that's exactly what the church at Laodicea did. They were all yeasty. (laughs) They were all leavened as much as you can get. And so during this seven process, the seven days, the, the seven workings, how many have noticed seven is encoded over and 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 over again in the book of Revelation? Seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven over and over again referring back to this, God's plan of salvation. One of the reasons we see seven and seven and seven and seven over and over again in the book of Revelation, God is getting ready to finish it up. Just like there were seven days to begin with. The emphasis on the beginning was when God, when God first hung the earth out of nothing, he already had a seven-step plan for the redemption of mankind. And when he finishes it up, all the sevens begin to come together in one huge climax of salvation and redemption. But right in the midst of that, you have the Laodicean church had no fight in them. They, oh, we got so much money, anything goes. You know, it's cool. As long as money flows, it's cool. Preach what you want from, from the pulpit. As long as the people are happy and they keep giving money. You see, the Laodicean church, you have prophets and prophetesses can stare at a man living in sin and demon-possessed and, and all this stuff and saying, God will make you rich because if you're rich, then you can become holy. A prophet of the unleavened bread says, you know what? You need to repent and get the leaven out of your heart. You need to get the demons out. You need to get the sin out. You need to go and you need to take all that and you need to crucify it on the cross. You need to get to the place where you say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet, not I. It's Christ living in me. The Laodicean church had none of that. They were so full of leaven that what God said in Exodus that if... You eat the leaven and it permeates you. I'll cut you off. And God says, I'm getting ready to spew you out. Can you see the connection between cutting off and spewing out? Now, am I spiritualizing all this away or am I giving a spiritual application this morning? Yeah, there is an app for that. And let me tell you something, you better start dealing with the apps. You better start dealing with the applications. Because I have seen believers that will go through their house from one end to the other to make sure that there is not a smidgen of leaven in their home for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but they enter into it with a heart chuck full. Missing. Because that, that season, we just ended it. Yesterday, we just ended it, was... I want, you, I want you to get the type and shadow. Ooh. Before Passover, you have four days to take a good look at Jesus, to take a good look at Jesus, to take a good look at Jesus, and then you got seven days to line up with what you see. Behold the Lamb. And what doesn't line up with him gets thrown in the fire. I as a priest under the order of Melchizedek, except during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the only offering I give up, the only sacrifice, is the sacrifice of praise. But during the time of Unleavened Bread, I am called to give seven sacrifices every day, a burnt sacrifice unto the Lord by the convicting fire of the Holy Ghost, that if I find any leaven in my life, baby, it's going to burn. If not, You're not doing unleavened bread with the New Testament reality. You're still playing with the shadows. Guys, how bad was it with the Laodicean church? 
Jesus ends it with says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now that has been the salvation call. Baptists have used it very effectively over the years. But that was given to the church. And we don't understand that that was the beginning of the process of betrothal. Hebraically speaking. That if Mary and I were living in community and I catch her eye and she catches my eye and I'd like to marry her. I'll go talk to my dad and she'll go talk to her dad. Then there's the appointed day that my dad and I come to her door and we knock on the door. And, if, and then her dad's looking at her and says, you, you sure you want to marry this guy? Yeah, dad. That's when you let them in. And the whole thing of, of him saying, I go to prepare a place for you and all the wonderful things about that, as well as then she has got to, part of her process while I'm building a place and preparing a place, she's supposed to be preparing herself to be meet for her husband. That what is he called to do? And I've got to align myself. I've got to learn whatever skills I need to learn. I've got to, I've, I've got to get rid of things out of my life that don't line up with him because I'm supposed to be his help meet. And we're supposed to be the bride of Christ without spot nor wrinkle, without spot nor wrinkle, without spot nor wrinkle, without spot nor wrinkle. And what happened with the Laodicean church? It had so long served another Jesus that Jesus had to begin the betrothal process all over again and introduce who he was and how that, they said, listen, you're preparing for the Antichrist, not the Christ. And it's time for you, I, I've got to come in so that you can find out who I am so that you can start preparing. Because you're dripping in the wealth of Babylon thinking that you're a bride ready to be married. But not to me. Much of the church isn't ready to marry this. They're ready to bury a big hunk of sourdough bread <laughs> that, had, that had its starter kit established in the Garden of Eden at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it has been fermenting and infecting ever since. And Jesus says, if I smell sourdough, I will say no. Now, I mean, I'm not preaching against physical sourdough bread. It is extremely good with beef pastrami, hot mustard, hot cheese. Yes, that's right. Everybody feels the dinner bell calling now, don't you? But the spiritual application. Yes, that right. so much of what's going on in the Laodicean church, they have so successfully prepared to be the bride of the beast That's right. that God says, I've got to spew you out if you don't come back and realize you're marrying me, not him, right. and you better start getting with the program. I'm on the, I, you have moved so far from me, I'm on the outside knocking, trying to get in, saying, I'm the one you're supposed to be marrying. I'm the one who bore your stripes. I'm the one who showed you the perfect life. And you better start lining up with me because I'm not going to... Chuck, wouldn't it just irk you a little bit if... We, let's go back in time, time machine. You and Rosie are getting married and, and getting ready to get married and you found out for the last two years she's been preparing a wedding to marry somebody else. And you just found out as you're supposed to be going down the aisle to get married to her. How many know you'd have a problem with that? Oh, yeah. I ain't married that thing. Especially when you find out she's been preparing to marry your arch enemy. You're supposed to be Superman and she's been trying to get married to Lex Luthor. Or you're supposed to be Batman, you find out she's all dressed up like the Joker because she's trying to get married to the Joker. I mean, you know, did you have a problem with that? Because the last thing you want running down the aisle is a joke. That's why the Apostle Paul said he's coming back for a bride without spot and wrinkle or any such thing. She knows who her bridegroom is. He's the unleavened bread. He paid the price for her preparation. He paid the price. And now she's lining up with this. Yeah. That's spiritual application. And if you don't get it, you're not going to make it. Right. You could find yourself thinking you serve Jesus and you end up serving another Jesus. And when it comes time for the wedding feast, you get spewed out and instead invited in. Yeah, that's, right. that's the power of the spiritual application of the feast. 
The springtime reminds me I've got to line up because I've got to prepare. And the fall feast, I've got to make sure I'm right with both God and man, and I am humbled when he comes back because only that which bows does not burn. That is spiritual application. And you can go all day long and you can get all the yeast out of your house. And uh, guys, I, I have known believers that have went through and thrown away hundreds of dollars worth of food preparing for the Passover. If you would take half of that energy and apply it inwardly. Do spiritual application. You come out, the spring feast a different person. You'd come out a different person. And listen, you, you know, it's almost like pruning. You're going to be pruned if you do and pruned if you don't. Jesus said to those that don't produce fruit, I, I prune. Those who produce fruit, I prune that they might produce more fruit. It's the depth of the prune. Now you have a choice. You can either take things out of your life and give it as an offering by fire of the Holy Spirit as an offering unto the Lord by fire or Jesus to get you to where you're going to make this he's going to hold you over the fire of persecution until that which you have attached to yourself burns off to save you I prefer the first I prefer the first because I see a lot of believers even getting into the Hebraic heritage that do not do applica- the spiritual application. They're not ready. They're not ready for anything. They're barely holding on now. What do you think it's going to be like not when we see the echoes of the Antichrist coming from Washington and coming from, uh, coming from the different governments of the world? Not an echo, but the real thing is here, ruling with complete power. How do you think you're going to hold up against that if you can't even tolerate just a little bit of pressure being put on you now? It's because the leaven weighs you down. The leaven infects you. It allows every disease. Even in the physical, there, there's a, a ministry called Know the Cause that they have traced back almost every cancer and every major disease to a yeast yep. infection, a fungus infection in the body. Uh-huh. And you get rid of the leaven, the body heals itself. You want to talk about a spiritual... You want to talk about a spiritual application. The, the more of the yeast and the leaven you get out of your life, the easier it is to function within the kingdom. That is spiritual application, and that, my friend, is end of day spiritual warfare. If you become like this, then devil can't touch this. Any place where you're puffy, he can grab on to because it belongs to him. He can't touch this. This is not of the world. There's nothing of his doctrine. There is nothing of the lie that stemmed from the tree of knowledge that he can grab onto. And yet today in the earth, have you ever noticed they're talking more about those who are illuminated? Those who are enlightened? Well, we we need enlightened theologians. We need need enlightened politicians. We need enlightened intellectuals, lovey. You know what that is? That enlightenment comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because the Antichrist can grab onto it and function with it. The real Jesus can only function with this. He'll only tolerate this. He'll give you a chance to get the leaven out, but he can't function through you the way he needs to. That's the purpose of the spring feast, to make sure the blood is over the doorposts spiritually, to make sure that you have examined the lamb for four days, and then to make sure that you have entered into this period to make sure there's no leaven in your house. And if you don't do that, you've missed the whole point because we're no longer dealing with shadows. We're dealing with the real thing. Father, I just thank you for your word. Father, I just ask that you would forgive us this morning of allowing the leaven of Babylon to be entered into the perfect picture of Jesus and to so mar his image, to so skew who he really is that we have allowed another Jesus to be preached, Father. We, we repent of that. Father, give us the tenacity and the strength 
to only hold on to the real Jesus and only to preach the true gospel of the kingdom and to only hold up the sinless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Father, also give us the strength to deal with the leaven that's been placed in us, Father. Sometimes it's false concepts, it's pride, it's arrogance, but it can also be deep wounds that those wounds have become infected with the leaven of Babylon. Father, give us the grace to remove the leaven and to see those wounds healed. That that can no longer be a place the devil, all he has to do is push our buttons to control us. But Father, when we're unleavened, the peace of God flows so easily. The kingdom of God flows so easily. The healing power of God flows so easily. And Father, that's the, that's the high road, that high life that you called for us to, to have where the, it's not a struggle to get to the kingdom, but it just simply flows as we see in the life of Jesus. Father, we long for that. Give us the grace to remove the leaven. Give us the grace to embrace the fire of your spirit to burn those things out of us and to empower us for your purpose, for your kingdom. And let us prepare for the bridegroom we ask in a new and powerful way. 